All right, good evening, everyone. So welcome to our PVSD board meeting. Uh, we have translation in Spanish. If you need that support, please see Orania Lopez. So tenemos traducción en español. Si necesita de este servicio, por favor, pase con Orania Lopez. Um, if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, please uh, fill out one of our speaker cards and hand it to Eva Renteria. And each speaker, and please hand it in before the start of the agenda item. And each speaker will have two minutes. So for the Pledge of Allegiance, um, Trustee Scott, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. We'll have our superintendent comments. Well, as I was, so last night we had our Youth Cinema Project um, Oscars night. And as I was sitting there, I was just um, filled with such pride over the work that um, we're doing and the work of our students. So the last several weeks, um, last week and this week, um, we've had so many things that have highlighted our staff, our students, um, and our community in a positive way. So we had our Innovator of the Year Awards, um, where we recognize all of our certificated and classified staff. As I mentioned, we had our Oscars night last night. We also had a retirement event today, um, where we saw employees that had been working with us some um, in the 80s, and one started in the 70s. Um, and so it was really a tribute to the dedication and the work. Um, and then, of course, to our students that are going to be graduating, I'll be there um, at, for most of you all, but um, we're going to be starting tomorrow night with our first set of graduation. So we're having our adult education. We're a very unique system because we not only have um, students that are under a year old at Duncan Holbert, so our very little ones, all the way to we are supporting students in their 80s and um, I think one in their 90s. Um, and so um, congratulations to all the students who are promoting up or graduating um, because we do it for you. Um, and so thank you very much. Thank oh. One more thing, sorry. Um, and then we had a really special event um, or um, time this past week, um, Moriel, um, Alicia, and Lisa Aguirre, and myself, we were able to interview for the next um, student trustee. And I think all of us that have been watching Moriel over this year will say um, she is a tremendously smart, um, intelligent, articulate, um, thoughtful and student trustee, so she is going to be hard to replace. Um, but we were able to make a selection. Um, and so we um, selected Ruby Romero Maya from PV High School. And um, I know that um, Muriel will mentor her from afar and we'll try to do um, the same thing. Um, but I wanted to thank Muriel for being here and for being such a such a great um, student trustee. She sometimes, and people that have watched our board meetings will know, sometimes she says um, her comments are almost more thoughtful and reflective than um, any adult that I know. So she is on a good track um, and will do a good thing. So thank you, Muriel. With that lead in, why don't we go ahead and start with our student trustee, uh, Muriel. Do you have any um, comments you'd like to make? I do. Thank you, Dr. Holm. Um, so this is the final night that I'll be here in this boardroom. And today has just been a really like a whirlwind because it was our last day for like high school seniors at my school. And it was just so busy like running around to our last classes. And it was also like really, I wouldn't say emotional because that's for a grad day. <laughs> But it was more or less surreal just to see everyone and be with our teachers for the last time this year. Um, but in this room, I just wanted to extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who has really been a mentor to me, um, you know, just coming up to me and making me feel at home here. 
Uh, I'm lucky to say that I've felt really comfortable sitting in this seat because I know a lot of students who I've also been in their position, but you know, they find coming up here to that podium really intimidating, and I don't blame them. It really is. Um, sometimes we face a lot of situations in this boardroom that are really high tensions, and that's, that's the intimidating part. But I just want them to know that they're he they are here for you, and everyone that's sitting who are, you know, it seems like they're judging you and everything you say, and <laughs> um, it might seem really scary, but they do the work they do for us, and I hope you know that, and I'm so proud of the ones who have, you know, gotten the courage to actually get up and speak for their peers, because I think we all need to be mindful of those who might not have that sort of bravery or even, like, opportunity to you know say what they want to but we hear you we see you we see you and I'm just really grateful to have been here um, you know there's a lot of work that this district can see in the future but I hope that I've served as sort of like a source of inspiration for students because I know coming into this seat I hadn't really had someone to look to or you know like a previous student really because I haven't really um, seen that before and so I hope I can be that person for Ruby um, who's gonna do amazing I already know it and I just hope that we continue to listen to students and involve them yeah thank you thank you <laughs> trustee DeSerpa thank you um, I said this I think maybe last time I'm not sure but um, I attended the Queer Youth Award, Leadership Awards, and uh, Moriel received um, one of the biggest awards of the night for, I think, for being an ally to queer youth. And so I was really, really proud of her, proud of Watsonville High, and proud of our district, Pajaro Valley. So Moriel, congratulations on that great big award that you won and for your work. Um, it's a busy, busy time of year for everybody. There's something going on um, almost every night of the week uh, in the past two weeks. Um, I did attend the Innovator of the Year Award honoring our teachers and staff who um, stand out amongst their peers and were honored to be nominated and was so proud to be there um, celebrating the achievements. I wish um, all of them could, um, could have won their um, category, but um, we're there. it's an honor to be nominated. Um, this last weekend I spent in Sacramento um, for the California School Boards Association. Um, I'm a delegate to the assembly and um, was proud to represent Pajaro Valley for the first time in a long time um, for Region 9. And Region 9 consists of Monterey County, Santa Cruz County, and San Luis Obispo County. So there were um, 10 of us delegates there together representing the Central Coast and it was really um, special to meet other people. and just hear the challenges that are happening in other districts. Um, we had a um, um, presentation on cybersecurity, and I'd like to actually ask um, uh, for, a, for a, um, a presentation t to our board about what we're doing about cybersecurity. Many of the other districts around the state have been hit with ransomware um, situations, and so I just want to make sure our data is safe. So I'd like to have a presentation in the future about that. We heard a presentation about the budget. Um, unfortunately, the state is, at this point, about $31.5 billion deficit compared to what was projected and probably will go up about 10 or $20 billion up from there. So the governor is starting to tighten um, the belt, um, including on schools. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then we heard about a lot of bills that are working their way um, through the legislature. Um, Monday night I attended the school board association meeting where I meet with um, representatives around um, Santa Cruz to talk about issues confronting Santa Cruz County schools. I'm looking forward to going to um, all the graduations including Thursday night at the Watsonville Adult School <laughs> and all the graduations next week. So congratulations to all our students and families and um, thank you to all our staff and teachers for their hard work this year. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Soto. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for attending tonight. And uh, I just want to take some time and congratulate all the graduates out there. Uh, 
it's that time of year, it's a time of accomplishments and time for moving on and higher learning. And congratulations to you, Moriel, on your accomplishments and good luck with that. Uh, I myself have two of my children that are graduating from college this year as well. We just had a ceremony this past weekend and we'll be having another one here in a couple of weeks. So uh, like Trustee DeSerpa stated, you know, it is a busy time of year and I'm feeling it just like everybody else. So thanks again. Trustee Scow. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, to everybody here in the room and also everybody who watches us on YouTube. I know there's a lot of people watching us. Uh, thank you for participating in your school board. Um, I do also want to say congratulations to Moriel. Congratulations on Cornell. You've been a great, uh, a great student trustee for us. And thank you for your comments about inviting more people to be engaged with our school board. So important. Um, also, congratulations to the graduates. I know many of us will look forward to seeing them graduate uh, in this coming week. It's very exciting. Congratulations. I uh, also want a special shout out to um, the music teachers and they're doing concerts, end of the year concerts. Uh, special shout out to uh, Mr. Alanis at PV High, uh, outstanding music program. I got to go to an earlier concert this year. There's about 100 people in the library. Very impressive. Uh, also to uh, teacher Miss Susanna Blake at Lake uh, at Lakeview. She's doing a concert tomorrow. Uh, f fantastic job and uh, there's a lot, a lot of great music teachers. So thank you to all our arts teachers and music teachers for your work this year. It's been very inspiring. And um, also a special shout out to uh, in the after school El Sistema. They're having a concert tonight. I'm missing it because I'm here. Um, but it's been a uh, first time there's a district wide orchestra. Thank you to our superintendent for helping spearhead that. But, uh, very important. And uh, I was at the rehearsal right before I came here and they sounded really great. So uh, thank you everybody. Trustee Flores. Hello everybody, thank you for coming out tonight. And I also want to say congratulations to all you class of 2023 graduates out there. Um, I was also able to attend the Innovator of the Year Awards um, ceremony, it was great. I loved being able to see all the uh, classified and certificated workers there that were being recognized. Um, Dr. Medina at Starlight, the principal at Starlight, just recently invited me to go and um, take part of their Language Ambassadors Award ceremony and that was so sweet. It was the kinder, third, and fifth graders who are uh, receiving awards for their accomplishments in their dual language there. And that was really exciting to see all those happy little faces. Um, we did have a green team committee yesterday. And again, I just want to remind everyone about the balloon ban. Um, I know we have had a lot, few parents asking why. Um, and, you know, it's really just, it's environmental. And this whole balloon ban was spearheaded by students who wanted us to do better by our environment. And so we want to support that. And so please um, use, choose a different alternative to balloons for your graduates. Um, and then tomorrow I'll be attending the Cesar Chavez um, Middle School mural dedication. So if you're available, that's tomorrow at Cesar Chavez Middle School at 5.30. And that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Trustee Orozco. Oh, wow. <laughs> Flashback. Yes. <laughs> Acosta. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Trustee Acosta here. Um, just for clarification, um, I'm going to echo the same. Uh, just a big congratulations to all of our graduating um, seniors this year and all of our students that are promoting um, forward. Um, I did attend um, agenda setting committee. Um, I unfortunately did miss the safety committee meeting. I had an urgent um, unexpected conflict that came up, but I will be following up with Clint and his team um, to um, clarify um, what was discussed and what I missed there. Um, but I do want to note that I'm really, really glad to see the safety and security measures that we see um, even with the construction inconvenience, I know construction's a big inconvenience all around this town right now. Um, but I'm glad to see these uh, safety and security measures going into place here at the DO. Um, safety and security at all of our sites is one of the most utmost important issues. Um, and, um, you know, especially in our current time. Um, with that, I would just also like to take a moment um, to acknowledge and recognize that today is the one year sad anniversary of the horrific shooting event that occurred at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, with the loss of 19 students, two teachers, and over 17 injured. I'm sure we can all share thoughts of our deepest sympathy 
to the survivors and their families and the families who lost their loved ones in this absolutely horrific and tragic event. And um, perhaps, President Holm, at your direction, we could just have a brief moment of silence to honor and recognize all those that were affected and impacted by this horrific event. Of course. Thank you. Moment of silence for those folks. Yes, yeah, so um, I was able to attend you know, the Innovator of the Year Award also. That, that is one of, it, it's just a joy to just see all of the exciting things that our, our teachers and classified staff are up to. And seeing how that ties into, I went to today's retirement event, and just you know how people have done so much throughout our district in so many different ways. Um, and the contributions that our PVUSD personnel, you know, make, you know, to this community, it's it's inspiring. And so, you know, for everybody who is contributing, you know, in ever, whatever way that you are, thank you. It does make a difference, um, and it's it's what makes it a a, a community. Um, I just also wanted to extend my personal. Um, feelings of gratitude for our student trustee. Marielle, it's like it was a, the first few months that you were you know, seated, I got to, before I was sitting in this chair, I got to sit next to you and it was just a, a, a joy to, to speak with you and you know, kind of, you never go, okay, this is what this means, this is, you know, and, and, and mentor you through those first few meetings, but you didn't need a lot of mentorship. And um, just your advocacy for the student voice is so important and uh, you did a phenomenal job, so thank you. All right, so we will go on to our high school students uh, board representatives and we have um, Diamond Tech. That's a video. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. I am excited to catch you up on everything we have been doing since March. I am Ruth Moctezuma, soon to be a Diamond Tech grad and Valley Victorian. It has been a very busy, it has been very busy at Diamond Tech for the past few months. And probably the most important and exciting news is that we have completed our WASC self-study visit and received outstanding commendations for the school and program. The recommendation is for a full six-year accreditation until 2029, which is the highest recommendation available for accreditation. And Ms. Keller can finally, hopefully, relax a little bit. We are very proud of our soccer team, which made it up, which is made up mostly of freshmen. They made the semifinals and ultimately received third place in the small school sports league. It was a very good game, and go Techies. We also had a fun day in Moss Landing for our science kayaking trip with our juniors where they in investigated the flu and the ecosystem of the area. Our La Pulga this year was another success and of course we will be having another one in October. So be in the lookout for that next year. Our school was able to visit the Wheels Construction Company in San Juan Bautista. Wheels Construction is famous for buildings all over the world and they have they are a local employee owned company. Service explored all aspects of major construction forms like accounting, engineering, and machinery. This is always a fan favorite. We also had our ninth annual business board competition. This competition has two thousand dollars with scholarships that are given out by our industry partner, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. 
there were really amazing business ideas being pitched from our techies. After business boards, our students entered the Foundation for Innovation Challenge where Diamond Tech students received, secured five of the available 10 awards. I would like to point out my partner Missy and I received $1,000 for the first place in the level two challenge as well as the award for accounting and financing. Congratulations to all the Diamond Tech 2023 winners. Student Leadership Plan 2, really in active student weeks, spring fling with egg decorating and planting stations, and Cinco de Mayo Spirit Week also included Teachers Appreci Appreciation Day and students and family came out to enjoy tacos and appreciate our teachers and celebrate each other. Some of our students and teachers took advantage of an opportunity to backpack in the Ventana winter wilderness for three days and two nights. It looked like a lot of fun and many memories were made. Some of our students were also invited to tour the Carpenter Unit Training Center in Morgan Hill to gain an understanding of the different types of apprenticeships available in this industry. We also had an opportunity to explore the local programs at CSUMB, MPC, and Carrillo, uh, from agriculture to digital media, business, and engineering. Mentor Till Building Day was a success with students and mentors completing different challenges and overall just enjoying each other's company and making connections. After the Team Building Day, mentors took their mentees on a job shadow experience to show them what a day in the life of their career will look like. Students say that this is one of their favorite activities of all year. The mentor program wrapped up with an end of the year luncheon and celebration. If you know of anyone who's interested in being a mentor at Diamond Techs next year, please have them contact Diamond Tech as soon as possible as we're already planning for the next year. Juniors and seniors had a chance to practice their interviewing skills with mock interviews. Your Future Star Business has been supporting Diamond Tech with interviews for the last past, for the last three years. They had, a, they, ha they had to have the resume ready and practice it in a real simulated environment, what a real interview will look like. Our students also participated in Your Future Is Our Business Luncheon. Diamond Tech students panel explained to the guests what an ePortfolio is and how to use it. During the luncheon, sophomore Corbin Karch Noble was awarded a 500 CTE scholarship from Your Future Is Our Business. Congratulations to Corbin. We had a freshman orientation and an open house to showcase on May 10th. The students presented all their work over the years. It was hard to believe we actually did all of that. We had parents doing science experiments and 3D printing, as well as practicing other projects that students have designed. It was a fun family event. Sierra had a fun day in San Jose for a senior trip. We did go-kart racing, ice cream, top golf, Dave and Buster's, and lots and lots of food. I am happy to announce that all our seniors passed their senior defense. This is where the seniors defend that they have achieved mastery of learning over the four years of Diamond Tech. The other grades also do a passage defense where they defend their mastery of learning over the year. Passage defense will, be, will take place during the finals week. And if you're interested in seeing what it is like, please contact Jasmine in the office. Finally, seniors had a graduation photo shoot at Nissan Park. You will have to come to graduation to see all, how those pictures turned out. But Gabby couldn't get, stop holding those banana slugs. We would like to invite the board to our graduation summary, which will be held on June 1st in the Metal Center at 3 p.m., 3.30 p.m. Have a great Memorial Weekend, and don't forget to follow us on social media. And thank you again for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. school.
Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez and audience. This is Dawn. That's also me up there, and this is Reina. Um, and today, uh, we're juniors at New School, and today we will be talking about um, all the fun things that we did for the last quarter of the school year. We appreciate this year's slogan because here at New School, we always try to lift each other up and find ways to improve ourselves, and we never give up. This is our 10th year. My apologies. Um, this is our 10th year of outdoor school and character development, and these are our school families. This was the first day of outdoor school where we hiked, learned how to do archery, and welding with each other. For the next field trip, we went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and we did a deep sea lab, and we also studied a whale fall. Our next trips, half of us went to Elkhorn Slough and the other half went whale watching. We got to see the orcas migrating south and the captain had said it was the most number of orcas he had ever seen. I went hiking and I would like to say the view was immaculate. On Earth Day, we had eight students show up to volunteer where we worked with our community partners to help the day go smoothly and it was amazing. Day four of outdoor school and character development, the whole school did community service. We removed non-native plants, picked up about 40 pounds of trash, and tested the water. We found and studied aquatic macroinvertebrates in many of our samples. Jody Richardson took us to volunteer at the 26th Annual Queer Youth Leadership Awards. This was a great opportunity for us queers to be around our community. We also attended the third annual progress flag raising ceremony and we are very fortunate to have a district that is inclusive to all students. Miguel Ortiz will be receiving the Watsonville Rotary Scholarship. He is a very motivated student. He came to New School to recover credits and he hit the ground running. He always found ways to overachieve and worked very hard on his schoolwork. He will be attending a trade school in the fall. Our staff also attended the California Continuation Education Association. Richardson presented using art to boost student participation, which many of the attendees had said was the most engaging workshop of the weekend. And our incredible office manager, Olga Cornejo, received the 2023 Classified Employee of the Year. This concludes our presentation. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And do we have students from Renaissance High? Hello, good evening. My name is Fabiola Torres. Along with Fabi is Brandon. My name is Cameron. And we are representatives for Renaissance High. Okay, I'd like to start off by thanking you guys for letting me come talk for the second time. Uh, I'm glad I could have the chance to come here and tell you guys about how the year's been going. Recently, our school held a pizza and paint event in the cafeteria, which gave students the opportunity to earn extra credit. Oh yeah, the, okay, so these are the student, student of the month for the May, month of May. Their names are um, Juan Mora and Zayamara Alvarado. They're cool, I know Juan Mora personally, I don't know Zayamara though. <laughs> okay, now we're here. Um, it's the pizza. Okay, re recently our school held a pizza and paint event in the cafeteria, which gave students the opportunity to earn extra credit. A few teachers even took part in the event by painting their own artwork next to the students and everybody got to eat pizza, which is always kind of good. Mr. O and his class, they've been working on this new project that consists of a mini library that's eventually gonna hold books. Mr. O always makes sure that the quality of whatever he's making is good, and he does a good job at teaching students ways to construct things. 
then the superintendent stopped by Renaissance and visited our classes while we were completing assignments. <laughs> and I hope she was able to talk to a lot of students and hear from the students at school. And then last week we had career day on campus and the school brought firefighters on social school grounds. They had equipment set up outside of the gym so students can ask questions and learn about the gear they had out on display. Inside the gym, they had booths with different people representing different jobs. They also explained that their line of work consisted of different things when students were asking about it. And in my opinion, if there were career days that were more often like being held at school, it would just show, like, I guess, students more opportunities that there are out there because there's a lot of students at my school that are looking for opportunities that they don't know where to find them. And then that career day, it kind of put interest in a lot of people's heads. I know that for a fact. But then I think the next one is the three staff. Yeah, OK, so the first one is Miss Donnelly. This is my uh, advisory, actually, my advisor teacher. She's cool. <laughs> she's, yeah, she's cool. And then Daniela, this is one of the office ladies. She's, she's really cool. I talk to her a lot because I'm late to class a little bit. And then I, I, I get to conversate with her. The one that takes care of her. Yeah. And then this is Lynette. I know her from Aptos High because I'm from Aptos High originally. And then she was my counselor. She's cool. E, and then the Food What. So the Food What organization was also able to gather us in the cafeteria, talk to the students about how they helped the youth, and gave us opportunities to take part in what they had to offer. Yes, and then this is where I wanted to go. This is my part right here. All right, so um, every Friday, our school's soccer team, they were going to play against other schools. I know new school. They went to play against them. Um, I mean, I'm kind of glad. I could say that they were undefeated. And then the whole season, really, and they won the championships in the league that they play in. I think it's a small school league, too. But that's pretty, I don't know. A lot of, so I know everybody on the team. They were really excited when they came, came back. And then um, the next thing that I wanted to say is the, it was, yeah, it's the Great America trip. Um, thanks to the extended learning program, I'm personally, I'm not a senior. I'm a junior, but this was for the seniors. They were able to go to a field trip to Great America, and then they came back to school, and I heard a lot of stories about it. I don't know. Personally, I've never been there, but I'm trying to go one day, maybe next year. And next year's the end of our time. Yeah, and then, you want to do this one? Yeah, I'll do it then. That's cool. Okay, so the LCAP participation in the gym at our school gave students insight on how to prepare themselves for the next steps of their education so they could be more comfortable with moving on with their lives. And then with all that being said, I just want to say thank you to our campus security, Rob, for keeping Renaissance safe. I'd like to thank our new principal, Mr. Reed, for letting me come here. And thank you to the board as well. I just want to say have a good day. Thank you to all our students who presented tonight. All right, so we'll move on to um, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda, agenda with an amendment that we add an action item. Uh, we got a report last time about VAPA. It was a wonderful report. Many of us have heard a lot of concerns about VAPA staffing. I think the public deserves to, have, to understand what our thinking is and have, for us to have an open discussion about next steps on that. So I would make a motion that we add an action item to provide recommendation on guidance with next steps on visual art staffing in our elementary schools. I would recommend that we do that at a point where the staff could actually prepare a report. We got a report last time at our last meeting, so I thought it was appropriate that we could have a discussion and re recommended action on that. Um, I'm getting a lot of concerns about that in my district, and I know other schools have concerns as well. I just think it's only fair and transparent that we have a, a discussion about it. Um, doesn't say it has to be the end all be all tonight. I imagine it will continue, but 
My motion is that we add that to the agenda. Items yeah, it's to an agenda. It's there's a, it would be a Brown Act violation to do so. So you can add a discussion. Well, I don't even know if you can add a discussion item, but we have to have technically seven, you had hours. to do at least um, the proper posting, and that did not occur. So I would encourage the board to not do so because I do believe it would be a Brown Act violation. I, um, I'm sorry, can I speak? Yeah. Um, Adam, I think your concern is duly noted and the agenda setting committee can discuss if it can fit on the next agenda. I think that would be the proper way to handle. Well, I'm asking for a second. I'm happy to ask and answer questions. That's what I was gonna ask also is maybe, um, I think what we're wanting, maybe what he's asking is that it's, it be on an agenda. And so if it would be in violation of Brown Act to make it an action item, maybe like we're petitioning to the agenda setting committing, committee to make it a discussion item on a future agenda. I'm not sure. You can do that. You can do that. Yeah. I, can, I, can I answer? Well, the reason why I think we should do something tonight is because we are at nearing the end of the year, and so there's some questions about what's going to happen next year. And I think it's only fair to our community that we, I mean, if, if it's true, I don't, I'm not a lawyer, I don't have a lawyer here to, whether or not it's truly a Brown Act violation or not, but. We can open up the Brown Act handbook, but it's 72 hours of notice for a regular board session. This isn't an yeah. emergency meeting, so that has, that's a seven, that's a 24 hour requirement for agendized items, but we're legally re required to post our agenda 72 hours you know, ahead of time. Well, I did request to agenda setting that this be an action item tonight. And it the agenda didn't setting responded, no, the mm. agenda setting committee responded to. My motion still stands. Um, I, would say, I, I, because I get, you know, that I think that um, a valid concern has been brought up about um, whether we can actually put it as an action item or a report and discussion item tonight without the 72 hour advance notice. Um, I think a good way to move forward is if we just as a genocide setting committee, committee, right, we could just commit, then we will bring this, our next meeting is the 14th, correct? That we will bring this forward on June 14th as an action item and maybe we can move this forward so we could get I, yeah. an amendment to I the motion. I don't know if I could commit to that, but I think the agenda set in committee can take it under advisement. Like we can talk about it, the three of us who are on the committee. I don't think we can commit right now to that, but I think certainly we can discuss it at our next meeting. Well, since there's budgetary issues involved with that and we have a budget special buddy, budget study session on the 17th and we have to approve the budget for the next uh, fiscal year by the 28th, I think it, I, to point, it needs to be brought forward. So I'm, I'm as one of those members willing to commit that, that has my full support to bring it forward that if, because of the concerns that were brought up about the Brown Act, um, if you're comfortable with my commitment to that, I mean, I'm one out of four, but that's my commitment to move this forward if, um, because I do have concerns about the Brown Act being violated tonight. And um, well, otherwise. I, I'd be willing to withdraw my motion if this could be on the ag agenda, an open session at the next meeting, because that's what I've requested. And the way agenda setting works is a minority of our board members are on agenda setting, and the other four of us are left, that's just how it is. I'm not saying good or bad, but that's what it is right now. And so that's why I'm here making this request. So if it could be on the next meeting as an action item, I think our, our community deserves that. Don't do it a fa favor to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm confused about what you're saying. What do you mean the four of us? What do you mean by the that? The other, agenda setting has three board members, uh -huh. not four. Well, the okay. superintendent they can't is have part four of the agenda. The okay, I understand that. I'm, right. not, I'm not saying we should change it tonight, but I'm just saying can't change it tonight. I'm, and I'm not trying to change agenda setting in general, but I, that's why I'm bringing this forward right now. And so I think our community deserves to have an open session item about this. If it can't be tonight, I'll defer to your expertise about the Brown Act. I've done some research on this. I'm not so sure it violates 
But if it does, can we please bring it to the next board meeting? I've stated my, uh, I'll, I'll support it being brought forward on the next meeting, being agendized um, if um, Trustee Bolanoskow is willing to um, amend his motion to get the agenda approved tonight so we can move forward. That's me, I'm one. And I'd like to just put on the record that I'd like to also see this as a item on the agenda because I have been bombarded with emails from the community um, asking us to take a deeper look into this. And I know we've discussed it privately. I think it should be a discussion um, that all get to hear. Yeah, I agree. So what, what is the motion currently? The motion, uh, well, I'd like to update my motion that we place this uh, agenda item uh, if I'm not going to get a second for this meeting and there's concerns about the Brown Act, but then I would move that we put it on the agenda for the next uh, board meeting uh, in the middle of June. I'm forgetting the exact date. The 14th. Thank you. That would be my motion. And approve tonight's agenda? And I'll approve tonight's agenda. <laughs> I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'll abstain. Five zero. I'm. Yeah. I'm a no. <laughs> so. Yeah. So motion carries five. No. Four. It's one one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. There it is. All right. Actually, we still go with an extension. So it's, yeah. it's four. It's four, one. four, one. Is one, two, three, yeah, four, four one, one, one. I was a no. Oh, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. four, one, one, one. Yeah. So this <laughs> So four yeses, one no, one abstention, one absence. Okay. All right. All right. So moving on to item 5.1. Um, Approval of the May 10th, 2023 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. A second. All right. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right. Item six, uh, public comment. So this is our opportunity for members of the public to address issues that are not on our agenda for the evening. And speaking once again about the Brown Act, just uh, reminding you that even though the Brown Act does permit us, does prohibit us from engaging in discussion um, on the non-agendized items, we are listening. So, do we have any public comments? We do. And I'll call you up by three. And if I mispronounce your name, please do correct me. I'm Marilyn Garrett, Chris Webb, and Lucia Herrera. Oh, there we go. Uh, in an effort to increase stakeholder involvement and thereby improve school operations this year, I took up the role of advisor for the student leadership class. Um, and while Renaissance has had student government before, um, at least in our time, Dr. Rodriguez and I, this is the first time, Rena this is the first year Renaissance has formally presented before this board, and I'm very uh, proud about that. Um, and I, I know what it is to like work on something and then have it uh, like put the effort in and then not be able to to like carry it through so I just wanted to honor my my leadership group um, and, and speak a little bit about the the survey they developed and some of the results so they had surveyed 10 of 13 homerooms plus three of eight classified staff plus seven of 16 certificated staff not including the principal and substitute teachers and uh, when they asked would a police officer on campus make you feel more safe or less safe? 40% of respondents said either much more safe, or I'm sorry, 40% of student respondents said much less safe or somewhat less safe. 15% said 
much more safe or somewhat more safe, and the remainder are neutral. When asked whether they preferred letter grades or variable credits, 97% um, of students responded that they preferred variable credits, and 67% of certificate respondents felt the same. When asked whether they were considering attending a four-year directly after high school, 48% of students said no, 33% were unsure. Uh, when asked whether academic advisors or homeroom slash homeroom teachers should handle advisee schedule changes or if a single site academic counselor should, 67% of students said they'd prefer their academic advisors do that, and 80% of certificated respondents said the same. Uh, Marilyn, I had called you up actually first. Did you still want to speak? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, sorry. No worries. The reason I come here is because I want to see a safe and healthy learning and working environment by removing the dangerous microwave radiation of Wi-Fi, et cetera. I see these beautiful students, nice presentations. However, it's a toxic technology, as are the antennas and different radiation-emitting devices on this building and the adjacent building and the Wi-Fi. I left you articles, uh, copies of this uh, Caustic Commentary by Sally Fallon Morell in the spring edition of Wise Tradition called The Graphene Age 5G. And I have a few copies if somebody else wants this. Graphene oxide is a compound of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in variable ratios, which can be formed into ultra-thin layers about one nanometer thick. Graphene's high conductivity and flexibility make it the linchpin of 5G wireless technology as it is a super absorber of microwaves. Graphene oxide transistors are in every 5G transmission device. I think that's what's on top of the building there as well. The optimal signal multiplication frequency for graphene transistors is 26 gigahertz, the very frequency that the Federal Communications Commission is currently auctioning off. Wi-Fi microwave frequency bands range from 2.4 to 5 gigahertz. 5G frequencies operate at more potent power densities than those in the 4G range. A recent paper in Annals of Case Reports by EMF researcher Dr. Leonard Hardell indicates that exposure to the high frequencies you, and power minutes. density, let me finish the sentence, that's please, two minutes, results in Thank a host of neurological comments. symptoms, such as tinnitus, that fatigue, insomnia, emotional distress, skin disorder, and blood pressure that variation. Was two Thank you. Remove the harm. These are students. That was two minutes. Thank you. Um, I had called Lucia Herrera. Is she still in the room? Or are you in the room? I'm here. Oh. I was waiting for her. Okay. Good, good evening. My name is Lucia Herrera. I have been working at Amesti Elementary for the, uh, for, since 2012, almost 12 years. And for the past nine years, as a visual art release teacher. This evening, I'm here to attempt to understand why PBUSD is acting as a private sector company instead of an educational public institution. Board members, are you aware that our elementary visual art teachers' positions are being divided between two schools for the un uh, upcoming year? Are you aware that is if you are a music teacher, you can be hired and displace a visual art teacher that has been contributing to our community for years with high accountability and merits. Are you aware that in the name of the Save of Music program, PBUSD Elementary Visual Art Teachers 
that have been working for multiple years, giving countless volunteer hours for PVUSD students, family, and community members have an uncertain future and could disappear? We all work for an educational institution. I feel that this action teaches our community that if, if someone is not needed, they can be moved without considering their accountability, job experience, or their contribution to their school community. I do not feel that this is an ethical decision or that is a good example for our community. I am not being removed from my site because of low enrollment or because I have failed in my performance. I have been placed at two schools because an opportunity is given to a new teacher that teaches music. This individual has been working as in a teacher participation class setting, not as a release teacher. I strongly feel that this decision is not in the best interest of our students, community, or VAPA program. Thank you for your time, hard work, and disposition. Thank you. Our next three speakers, Ramon Gedmeto, Herrera, Jennifer Prophet, and Cliff Livingston. So, board, uh, my name is Ramon Jimeno Herrera. I'm a student at Aptos High in Santa Lucia Herrera, the art teacher who's being unjustly split up between two campuses. I would like to start by saying I should not be here. Not because it's a bad idea or because I don't want to do this, but because this should not be a problem, like this should not be a reason for me to be here. I should not be here because a teacher should never have to be forced to split up campuses, and the fact that this problem has not been fixed yet is unbelievable. How the problem is being handled at the moment makes me and many others very disappointed at district administration. It's a very bad example of what the district is for teachers, parents, and students. Why does a teacher have to be torn away from the community she's invested so much into and gained so much from? By doing this, you're destroying a community at MSD and at PVSD. The UMPVSD stands for unified. You should keep it that way. Thank you. Jennifer Prophet. Hello, I'm here to talk tonight about the proposal put forward for the organization of Renaissance in 2023-24. My issue of greatest concern with the proposal is comments made in the final page. While the proposal correctly states that there are deep divides within the staff, it does not address the reasons for those divides, nor the fact that the previous site leadership, current site leadership, and district leadership have all failed to follow through on commitments made to help the staff address and heal these divides and learn tools for building more positive and collaborative staff interactions. The Renaissance Administrator is attempting to place blame for staff divisions on a few folks, namely those who are advocating for some accountability for students who choose to commit behavioral infractions. There is a problematic student culture at Renaissance, one in which students say, I do what I want when I want without consequence and nobody can tell me different. Staff who recognize this problem are advocating for a system of behavioral response that holds students accountable by requiring that they receive some consequences or are prepared to repair harms caused by their actions when they commit such infractions. There are currently little to no consequences for students when they misbehave. For example, students consistently ignore attendance requirements but receive no consequences from the school for doing so. Last year, I was struck by a student in my classroom and that student received no consequences. He graduated and has since gone on to commit a number of crimes in the community, including battery on a police officer. Accountability for student behavior is not a complicated or novel concept and it is not something that should be ignored in an alternative high school in particular. To do so is unsafe and is negligent. Let's not make Renaissance the next school we are taking a moment of silence for. Students should have some consequences when they commit behavioral infractions. That is not unfair to them. In fact, it is what they need for their own healthy development as human beings and to become positive, productive members of society. Furthermore, many students at Renaissance matriculate back to their home school and when those students return to their home school, they must be prepared to self-manage behaviors because those schools actually have some accountability measures in place. Again, I'm requesting that the district invest the time and resources it has previously said it would invest in bringing some restoration and healing to the staff at Renaissance. And I urge you to reject the proposal for 2023-24, particularly since Mr. Reed will no longer be here to execute his plan. Thank you.
Cliff Livingston. Good evening, and thank you for your time and consideration. My name is Cliff Livingston. I'm a first grade teacher at Minty White Elementary School. I have interacted with many of you in the classroom and in the public. This is my first time addressing the board as an entity. My initial impetus for speaking was not unlike some of the speakers you heard before, the re recent proposal to change what we have seen as our VAPA program. I do have a letter from teachers of Minty White that I'd like you guys to read at your leisure when you get a chance. But my reasons changed. I'd like to use my remaining time to address how the situation I just spoke of, what has happened, seems to be a symptom of a greater sense of insularity, lack of communication and engagement, as well as a dearth of transparency between the board and district administration. In the classroom, I am asked to create and nourish an environment that allows my students to feel seen and heard in a safe manner, one in which they feel comfortable and compelled to share their ideas and encourage their peers to engage in the same way. The purpose of an education is the same as that of a functioning democracy. It allows those involved to foster an environment in a, way they, in, a, in a way they can succeed in openly challenging their own ideas, as well as those of their peers. So they may move forward to a greater common goal. The ideas of education and democracy are bound by common desires. Throughout the last several years, I've seen many changes to the makeup of our community educators, leaders here in the PVSD. And it's become increasingly clear that at times, our leadership in this room seem incapable or unwilling to engage in the same discourse that we try to model to our students. This intractability has curtailed the growth of trust and communication. In the past, district supervisors, board members, and on-site admin have collaborated and engaged in cooperative planning and in, in, in implementation of ideals. Currently, the model seeming to be used is based less on collaborative practices and more on dictates from district admin to mandate side policies and changes. We need to do better. I'm asking you as a teacher, do better. For the families in our communities, do better. And most importantly, for the students that we serve and you serve, please, we have to do better. Uh, Judy Gittlejohn, is it? Hi, good evening. I'm Judy Gittleson, and I'm an artist and an art educator, and I did that program at Renaissance. and. Um, I know the impact an art teacher can have on a person because I am a career artist and I didn't get here because of not being attended to by art teachers. And I know that to offer a quality art experience and quality art education, the frequency of sessions is really of importance and the intensity of which the uh, teacher engages with the student can have a tremendous effect on the student and an attentive art instructor can make a significant difference in a community like ours and really influence and expand horizons and educate and incentivize someone to think broadly and to nurture their interests. And it's my aim and my mission to um, encourage creative expression and it's my occupation. And I really think it's important to hold in high regard the artists, the educators, and the offerings that we're giving to our students and to um, split them in half is really a injustice to everyone. And arts education is so much more important than the immediate thing. It creates a sort of way to expand the mind and get into other subjects more easily. So I highly support keeping arts education thriving and build a high and a high quality arts education program. Thank you. We'll move on to um, section seven, employee organizations. So we'll hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. And we'll start with PVFT. Good evening, board. Um, okay, so first of all, happy Classified um, Appreciation Week to our classified brothers and sisters. Um, you, they provide a great service to us as educators and to our sites, and you know, they, this district doesn't run without them. The COLA establishes a base, so I'm just gonna go right into it. <laughs> the COLA establishes a base while the California budget faces, um, you know, 
a base for our funding of our of our district. So that's the cost of living um, uh, monies, the increase. And so it becomes the new base. So while we can hear of some of some hurdles, the governor has dedicated to maintaining this COLA, actually increasing it a tiny bit, um, which with this, with the, along with the Proposition 28 monies, will provide some stability to that base funding. So again, it's creating a new base. Um, so even though this COLA is being partially funded by one-time monies at the revise, it's still a COLA moving forward. So yes, there are those concerns because the one-time monies are the things that are being reduced, but the base funding is actually being increased. The issues regarding the arts and elementary, you heard me speak to this agenda item when it, for the discussion at the last board meeting. Um, and so while the district receives grant funding under Save the Music, um, the, dis the music teachers, they provide this instruction alongside with the support of the teacher. So they're not release teachers. They, this, this grant that the district receives has this clause in it that states that these, that our Save the Music teachers provide 45 minutes, at least 45 minutes of weekly instruction to every single class. So every student receives that during the week. So they're not release teachers. And what does that mean for the public? That means that um, a release teacher is, a person, is another educator who steps into the classroom and provides instruction of content because all of this is standards based, um, while the general ed, the classroom teacher, can then go out and do the professional duties of grading the um, students' work, uh, lesson planning, um, collaborating uh, it with another colleague if, they're, if they have a colleague also at, uh, having the same release. So that's what that a release teacher is for the people that are listening. So, um, and then there's this grant, the Save the Music grant. So this next year, with um, with the added funding that the district is getting on top of our base funding, we now have Prop 28 monies that are specifically for the arts. That's on top of, not in you know, in, on this, on in, you know, we're going to deduct or you know, reduce some, but it's on top of. The district is making an austerity measure on the backs of the educational experience for our student. So those music teachers, they will now be on their own with all the students. Right now, as with the assist of the teacher in the classroom, providing those grades for those students is not, it is, it's aided with that teacher because the teacher of record is with them. So now they're going to have upwards to 600 report card grades to provide. Um, this impact also extends to our science teachers because they are going to be then used. There, our science teachers are release teachers currently, but they work predominantly with the intermediate grades. Our students are tested. Um, the state They do the state testing for science, and, and um, there's various grades. So science instruction is very important. So what's going to happen is those science teachers are now going to have their instructional minutes reduced and the number of students that they're seeing increased. So is that good for our students? Is that really providing the whole child that, that public education they, they, de they deserve? So that's where our concern comes in, is this, this impact on not only the people that we represent, um, and you know, we can look at it as, well, this is our contract language and this in your contract, because this is what is always thrown back in our faces. Your contract language allows this. Well, up until this, up to the, right now, you've been providing an incredible, well-rounded educational experience for our students, but just because we have a new contract that the day after you all ratified it for us, after we ratified it, this came down the pike. This is now what we can do using your contract language. I would like to just ask that I do, and, and I'm, because I do want to list some names for our students that received our PBFT scholarship. So I just want to congratulate these 10 students. Um, they are uh, 
graduating high school students of our members. Our um, union dues go to, we do set aside some of those dues to provide these scholarships. Samantha French, daughter of Mary French. Ramon Villarreal, um, child of Carla Villarreal. Liliana Sunga, child of Julie Valens. Ashwin Chapagain, child of Yogendra Chapagain. Hannah Osborne, child of Rebecca Osborne. Peyton Padilla, child of Alicia Padilla. Basil Silver, child of Melissa Prudhomme Silver. Uh, Ch Anna Knott, child of Sherry Knott. Zoraya Sexton, child of Pamela Sexton, and Dalia Barranco, child of Monica Garcia Barranco. Congratulations to our graduates. Thank Congratulations you. to you for all your wonderful wins. Um, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers? We, we do. We have one. Chris Webb. Um, on uh, Cinco de Mayo, uh, five PVFT members arrived on site at Renaissance uh, well before contract time, myself included, and that was the day after we stayed late for open house. And when, when we arrived, our custodian and our principal were out, so we arrived to lock gates. And uh, when our office manager arrived about 10 minutes before contract time, we were able to access the site. And uh, later that day, our lead teacher would hold one of three voluntary staff meetings to discuss plans for 2023, 2024. Uh, nearly half of the PVFT staff on site stayed for this voluntary meeting, and that was despite having permission to leave early that day. One, um, one Pavan member earlier in the, the month, or, or at the special board meeting, um, had said that sites flounder without admin, and that without, and that we may, and that may well be generally true, However, um, without our WASC-approved student progress monitoring system, I've found that Renaissance has floundered more with admin just because sometimes they're influenced by um, their superiors who don't always uh, support the best practices at the site. And earlier this year when R Renaissance was without a principal, our lead teacher organized the most productive staff meeting we had all year. And I have no doubt that with the restoration of our pre-COVID PBIS system, Renaissance would again thrive with or without admin, especially now that we have the added, re or are gonna have the added resource of Virtual Academy. And in closing, I just wanna say I'm, I'm really proud of the dedication of PVFT members at, at Renaissance and that they've sh the dedication they've shown all year. And it's never been more clear to me that support for teachers truly means support for students. And, um, and by the way, Trustee Moriel, you've been great um, and I wish you the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CSEA? Okay. Do we have anyone from Pavam? Good evening, Trustee Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Katie Bajazi. I am the Director of Transportation here at PBUSD. And I'm here tonight to just give a quick update on my department. So um, we are winding down a great school year. And um, this summer we are going to be working really hard to fill the vacancies um, that we can, um, as many vacancies as we can with our new MOUs that we have with CSEA. Um, we have a $5,000 signing bonus for anyone who comes in who's already licensed. And then we have a $2,500 signing bonus for any trainee who promotes to um, a school bus driver after they finish their training. So we're um, really excited about those MOUs and we hope that they will um, allow us to retain potential candidates and um, fulfill our vacancies. Um, we're also really excited to announce that um, we're very close to uh, the delivery of our electric buses. Um, we hope that in the fall when we receive them, um, you guys, the Board of Education, as well as our green team, will join us for that uh, reveal. Um, so um, we're Really excited that uh, this will be a huge improvement to our department as well as our community. Um, and we are also going to be working, I'm gonna be working with um, Andrea Carlos Willie in June to um, apply for some more electric buses on the round two of the EPA um, uh, grant that just opened up. Um, also, um, it's been a pretty challenging year, so I'm also super thankful to uh, the directors and managers who've helped um, and really stepped up and helped my department this year. 
Uh, most recently, Sergio Ambriz um, called him out the other morning to help me because I was the only one in the office and I needed uh, somebody to come pick up somebody from a broke down bus and he called me up pretty soon and he goes, oh, I fixed the bus, it's on, it's on the road. And I was like, wow, thanks, that's really, you fixed the bus, that's awesome. So super thankful to maintenance and operations as well as um, all of the other directors and managers who have helped my um, department in a pinch. And um, also would like to thank our classified staff who have stepped up. We've been meeting monthly um, with my managers to discuss improvements and ways that we can improve our department. So um, that's been pretty exciting also. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to echo the sentiments of the board and congratulate all of our 2023 graduates. Um, and um, while we face a very busy end of the year, I would like to thank our management team, dispatchers and drivers for making this year happen for all of our students. So congratulations graduates and have a good night. Thank you. Do we have anyone from CWA? Uh, I have, oh. we have one public speaker on this, Chris Webb. Um, once in the fall and then again um, in the spring, I had a student tell me, oh, you should just be principal. And uh, I prefer Renaissance principal to any other site, but I don't really have any desire for that. And one of the reasons is because I'm worried that I would face pressure to uh, like serve my, my bosses but it might come at the expense of what I know to be right by my students and staff. So, um, I, and this is especially if I wouldn't have the protection of a union. So I would, I would have less ability to defend doing the right thing. And I also worry that if I were to leave the classroom, what effect it might have on me. At one of the last uh, special board meetings, we heard about principals um, being former teachers and union reps. And when I talk to my teacher friends in other districts, uh, we, you know, we see people go from teacher to, to principal, and we like ask ourselves, like, oh, well, how long till this guy forgets what it's like and like, you know, loses a piece of themselves? How long? Chris, and is this specifically related to Pavan? This is, this is. Because I, I, I'm thinking that we could alleviate shortages in the employee group, both of teachers and with Pavan members, because many of them were talking about leaving earlier this year. And we could alleviate that if we ensured that there was um, pr uh, a way to promote where they would still have a section of teaching. So they could keep the demands of the classroom in mind and keep the students at the forefront of what they're doing. And also I want to just close by commending um, Extended Learning and specifically Nancy Zuniga for helping deliver fun new experiences for Renaissance and um, for helping at least in part restore after school program which was a critical piece of our success pre-COVID. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with her. Thank you. All right, do we have anyone from uh, Communication Workers of America? Not tonight. All right, moving on to uh, section eight, our report and discussion items. Um, item 8.1, our PVUSD students earn this the California State Seal of Civic Engagement, our first in PVUSD and in Santa Cruz County, and it will be presented by Julie Edwards. Oh, there you are. Good evening, President Holm. Board Trustees, Superintendent Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for welcoming us to um, share in the celebration of the first three students in our school district to earn the state seal of civic engagement, and and the first in San we're the first district in Santa Cruz County to have this designation. And we'd like to invite Dr. Holm to join us with this because she um, was a part of our task force that helped to bring this to fruition, and. Um, so you're, you have a job. <laughs> this will be your job in a moment. So um, each student is receiving a certificate that acknowledges they're earning the State Seal of Civic Engagement, which really is centered around a civic engagement project. And they've demonstrated leadership and a lot of thought and care around that leadership project. And these three students, their project was bringing the State Seal to, the, to PVUSD. So the work that they did 
is going to pay it forward for students going into the future, much like the seal of biliteracy has grown by leaps and bounds over time, so will the state seal of civic engagement. So um, where is Mr. Berman? Okay, so your job is the certificates. Right. And I will help you. So first, first person is Paula Camacho. Congratulations, Paula. <laughs> And I think our second student is, is very familiar, Morielle Mamaro. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Yay. And last but not least is uh, Marco Padilla Perez. Congratulations, Marco. And on behalf of everybody that worked so hard to make this happen and these three, three students leading us um, the way, through the way, um, congratulations and enjoy wearing your medals at graduation. And Marco, that'll be next year. Marco's an example of a student that can earn the seal in the junior year, which is super exciting. So congratulations. Um, Mr. Berman, did you want to say anything? I'm just so excited and I get to do this one just to tag on and then do the seal and so I love having these celebratory moments so congratulations to the three of you and I know it's growing and growing and we have another project this summer that builds on the work that you all did so thank you for trailblazing. It's very special. The first in the county. Oh my God. Señor, usted también. Yo luego le comparto. Déjeme la. Se la tomo si quiere. Dámelo. No se esconda. No hiding. Okay, you can see me, I can see you. You too, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with the other picture cards. That was very good. Okay, era la foto. Perfecto, you want more? Thank you. Do we have um, any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? I know for um, myself, you know, I can't state how strongly enough that I, you know, how pleased I am uh, to see this come to fruition. You know, our systems of government are strongest when there is vigorous and diverse participation from people of all ages and backgrounds. And I think every one of us up here can attest to the importance of advocating for what you believe in even if you don't win every battle or vote you know you make a difference in the outcome regardless um, even when it doesn't feel like it and in taking the steps that you know our students have, have taken in earning the seal of civic engagement you have taken up tools that will provide an, av an advantage in navigating the sometimes tricky waters of government you'll benefit your families benefit, and the community will ultimately benefit. And it gives me a great deal of hope for the future. So thank you. <laughs> Moving on to um, item 8.2, the California State Seal of Biliteracy. 
Michael Berman, that's you, our Director of Equity, State, and Federal Program and Accountability. All right. Uh, good evening, President Hall, members of the board, and Dr. Rodriguez. I once again have the privilege of presenting to you all um, this year's update on the California State Seal of Biliteracy. Um, as you've heard me talk about it, it is uh, an honor to receive this. It demonstrates biliteracy or multiliteracy in multiple languages, um, proficiency in another language other than English and English itself, um, bestowed to seniors who meet um, the requirements, the, the criteria. This year we, do, we, we did reintroduce the, um, the CASP test, the California State Perf um, t uh, Performance and Progress Test of Standards Met, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that with the reintroduction of that. But, the, but there's basically four criteria. One is grades in English language arts, um, and then also the CASP, as well as um, that language other than English. And if you are an English learner, it's also a four or reclassification on the LPAC. Um, we do have, uh, and this is, this is something to look forward to, I've, I've promised this in the past and this year we have an official um, recipients of our Pathway Awards. We have, I believe it's 71 in fifth grade and 24 in eighth grade who are receiving at their sites um, uh, uh, certificates and, um, and they, they celebrate them in different ways at this point, but, but we're kind of starting to pull them all together. So there's some exciting stuff coming up and as we're growing our dual language programs as well. Um, this year, these are the numbers since the beginning and you will notice that in 2023 we did have fewer. Um, we do still have 36 pending um, and that is based on assessments, some grades, some coursework and, and whatnot. Um, and this is where I'm going to reintroduce that, that conversation around CASP testing. Um, our understanding is, is that the significant decrease is based on our um, uh, grades and the reintroduction of that um, criteria. However, there is pending um, legislation going to the state this summer that will not make it an and. So right now it's a it's a English grades English requirement grades in high school and proficiency uh, standards met on the SBAC. The current legislation proposes with with great support that it's an or. So you have to meet one of th those two criteria. And if that's the case, um, it'll it'll reflect more closely to last year's numbers um, where that was the case because we didn't have the SBAC. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, we don't know at this point if we'll be able to retro. Uh, for this year on the number of students who didn't uh, meet the standard in um, SBAC but still met the grades because we do have quite a few of those. Um, and then just some examples of, of what it looked like on that night. Um, it was a lovely night at the Mellow Center um, and I can leave it with this and, um, and take questions. Oh, be, and before I go, I wanted to another bright spot. Um, every year in the Pajaronian, we publish an article with the names of all of, our all of our students that have reclassified this year, and there are significantly more than there were last year and the year before and the year before that. So this is bright spot because this is students. These are students whose primary language is other than English who are demonstrating proficiency um, and academic proficiency as well to move towards reclassification and no longer designated as English learners. So this, these students hopefully will one day be on that stage with us. Any questions? <laughs> we, uh, we do not have any public speakers thank on this. Any discussion from the board? Yes, Trustee Flores. I just want to say that I really did enjoy see, meeting the fifth graders at Starlight, at Starlight who, yeah. who are going to one day be up here on stage. Yeah. And so I just. I had a, a discussion with Dr. Rodriguez about, you know, this this um, dual language, you know, um, educational system because it's n different from when I was in school. And so, yeah, I'm very excited to see these numbers and to see our, all of our children, you know, getting, being dual language. So I think it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Scott? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to second Trustee Flores' comments. It's really a huge, immense source of pride for our district is how many bilingual 
students we have here, and and it's it's great to see them getting recognition. So let's keep it up. Thank you. Do I, yeah, I'd just like to say I'm really proud of this event. It didn't start that long ago, right? How many years? We've been doing the awards since 2012. I'm not sure when the event started. It started before my tenure. Um, mm. I think it might have been the year before I took my seat. But um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really important. And it really, I think, serves to um, uphold the fact that being bicultural and bilingual in whatever language you happen to, mm -hmm. to be, whether you've studied for it or whether it's a native language, it's really, really important. Yeah. And, um, and I love this event, so thank you. I love hosting it. And I just wanted to add, you know, it's like it was, it was so special being there, you know, and seeing just the range of, you know, languages and, and you know, what the additional language was you know that it was like for some students English was the additional language for some students it was Arabic was the additional language for some students ASL, ASL. was the additional language and you know and it was just that wonderful tapestry of different languages and ways of thinking about the world were um, was just remarkable and so I'm just so excited that yeah, I, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, we discovered that there's a way to um, assess as a, as a language other than English, Mixteco. Um, we didn't get any volunteers to try and be our pilot this year, um, but we're really excited because in the future that will be one of the languages that hopefully we'll be able to honor. Yeah. That's wonderful. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. All right. Moving on to item um, 8.3, Governor uh, May revised update. A report will be presented by Clint Rucker, our Chief Business Officer. Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, so I'm here to provide the May revised update. I wish I had a lot better news. We didn't get a lot of great news from uh, May Revised. We didn't get a lot of news in general. There's a lot of kind of what we anticipated, what we saw coming. Um, as a reminder, I'm not trying to be the bearer of any bad news. Just informing the board what we learned from the governor's May Revised, what the big takeaways were that we saw, and kind of the takeaways we saw as um, not only a district, as a state in terms of education, as well as the other CBOs and I talk uh, amongst ourselves in the county and talk about what we saw as a county, what we're going to see. So as a reminder, um, the governor's process really starts in January um, in terms of when we first see a budget from him. After that, uh, the LAO, the legislative analysts, they review the budget. They have hearings where they actually discuss what um, really the legislator want to see added to that budget. Then we get the May revision where the governor kind of takes some of those recommendations into play and he creates what he calls his May revised budget. We then go into conference summaries. That's where, once again, Senate and Assembly will talk and say, here's what we don't like about the May Revise and we want you to change. They actually end up passing the budget. So the governor doesn't pass the budget. They do. The governor, though, ultimately is responsible for signing it and can veto anything that they add or try to take out. Rarely in California does that happen because we are a pretty uh, democratically run Senate Assembly and governor. So normally they agree, but there are, there are little things normally the governor and this assembly don't agree on that you kind of see either come out of the May Revise or go back in. So just to give a little um, update on the state budget, what we're seeing statewide, um, one of the biggest things we saw was a 20% decline in the S&P 500. Now, that impacts our highest income earners. You might ask, well, how does that really impact state revenue? So state revenue is made up of three big taxes, sales tax, corporation tax, and public and income tax, effectively. Income tax makes up 62% of that. Of that 62% of all income tax, 50% of it so 31% of all of our taxes we get in California come from the top 1% of earners. So if you think of that just in income tax, when they're making less, the state's making less. When they're spending less, the state is making less. So that impact actually has a huge fall on California due to how progressive their tax system is. Um, we have seen the state revenue soften, as Trustee DeSerpa mentioned in her comments. 
um, we saw about a $10 billion decrease from what we expected in January. So in January, the governor came out, said there was about a $22.5 billion shortfall. They weren't making budget by that much. Um, they've actually increased that now to about $31.5 billion. As many of you know, we postponed personal income tax collections due to all of the disasters that hit the state this year. Obviously something that our, our communities really need, especially when we look at like the communities in Pajaro, something we are very appreciative of, giving those individuals more time to be able to collect themselves and actually do their taxes. Unfortunately, what that means is we have about $42 billion that the state doesn't even know if they'll get until October. Typically, they're rounding it up in April, right? Everyone's finalizing their taxes by April 15th. They're trying to rush in a month to say, what did we actually get so we can build a budget? They're delayed even more. So what does that mean long term? It means that you could see things like def cash deferrals if they don't actually get as much money as they anticipate in public in in income tax. Um, inflation is down, which is great. It's down from the 9.1% that it was in summer. However, it's still well above that 2% we've seen in the prior years. It's at about 4%, so 4.9%, almost 5%. And then California is actually losing residents of all income levels. So we know that we hear a lot of um, that we're losing lower income families. They're moving out of the state. They can't afford to live here. What we're actually seeing is actually some of those higher income earners are actually also leaving the state. And actually proportionately to how many of the lower level incomes are leaving. So we're just leave, losing really residents across all levels of income. All right, so good news. I unfortunately do not get to put a whole lot of bullets on here, not because there isn't good news in the budget. We saw some good news in the January budget. They are funding the COLA. That's always good news. We see a slight increase from 8.13 to 8.22. They also are going to fully fund the Universal Meals Program in 22, uh, 20, 20, 324. Um, the, they were anticipating this was more going to be like 24, 25, so they're actually funding it earlier than anticipated. The only reason there's only two bullets here, again, most of the other news was just no changes from January, so not a whole lot of new information in May. So this slide I like to call it's news because it's not necessarily bad news and it's not necessarily good news for, at least for us. Um, and I'd say argue for a lot of districts. So one is their proposed funding to the support the equity multiplier remains unchanged. That multiplier is a, um, it's a calculation the state's created to try and give more funding to the most needy um, of students or the most um, needy of districts. Part of that problem is that number is very, very hard to reach. It's for um, high schools, it's actually at 90%, not of unduplicated, but free and reduced. So none of our schools actually qualify if you only look at free and reduced. The only school that actually does of our high schools is new school. So of all these dollars the governor's putting in, a district like us sees it for one site and one site only, which tells you there's some, some districts that are probably getting quite a bit, but for us, we don't see a whole lot. Really, in talking with, um, again, other CBOs around the county, we really wanted to see this more move towards just extra funding for all districts. We unfortunately didn't get to see that. Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant remains fully funded. It is good. We're happy to be able to provide that before and after school. Again, it's additional money that for a district like us who gets a lot of money in ACES and 21st century funding, we really would have liked to see that more in general fund where we can spend it on our needs rather than having to focus only on before and after school. Um, we don't see any withdrawal from the Rainy Day Fund. You can take that as good or bad news. It's good that they're not dipping in. However, they are cutting a lot of our one-time money that was going towards arts and music and learning loss to cover their shortfall. So they're not dipping into that rainy day, but if things get worse, they probably will have to look into that. And then we see no deferrals. We do see reductions, which I'll get into, but we don't see any deferrals for 20, um, in 22-23 funding, which is great. So we're not actually seeing a reduction in or deferral in what we've got in cash this year. So again, we're talking this year, but we are seeing money that was actually allocated this year. They're now taking back. So rather than just saying we're going to delay it, we're taking it back. We were aware of this in January. It did change a little bit. So then what is the not so good? So the funding for the 8.22% COLA includes statewide enrollment reduction. So what does that mean? Typically when we look at um, the COLA, it's funded through additional revenue from the state. They're getting more revenue. They look at a, again, a nationwide calculator that determines what the COLA is. They use their revenue to meet that COLA. 
what the governor is doing right now is he's actually banking on the fact that California is reducing in enrollment statewide. And he's saying, well, if I have less students, I can use more money for those same students and give a, what appears to be a COLA because I'm funding less students with the same amount of money. So we actually saw Prop 98 funding go down about $2 billion in May versus what was in January, yet you saw a slight increase to the COLA. That's because, again, he's banking on the fact that we can actually use that money from um, the declining enrollment. Um, as you heard, state is relying on $2.8 billion of one-time funding to be able to support that ongoing COLA. What's the problem with that? So does it increase the base? 100% it does. Does that mean every year we now have that new base? We do. But now next year when the governor has to fund that as well as whatever the new statutory COLA is, he hits another bump in the road. Do I now have enough revenue from next year to fund last year's COLA and this year's COLA? Does he use one-time money again or does he say, Again, a statutory COLA is what's required, but it doesn't mean he has to fund that COLA. So does it mean that he's kicking the can down the road a little bit and in two or three years we're going to see a lack of funding for a COLA that we should get in the future? And then we see reduction to the arts, music, and instructional block grant of 49% and learning recovery emergency block grant of 32%. So you might ask, what does that mean for Pajaro Valley Unified? So the arts and music, 49% is about $4.5 million. And then reduction to the learning recovery grant is almost $9 million for us. So we're losing about $13 million due to these one-time reductions. Reviewing declining enrollment, um, you can see that statewide, we actually are seeing over the next 10 years, this is a 10-year look of what we're gonna see. They're anticipating about an 8.2% decline statewide. This slide was actually shared to me by um, a fellow friend at school services, he sent it to me, he said, here's slide, he goes, I just wanted to point out, if you look at the fourth uh, county there, Clint, I thought you might find it interesting. I went, oh, thanks, thanks, Matt, I appreciate that you wanna point out that Santa Cruz is reducing about 15.77% when statewide we're reducing about 8.2. So again, our county, not just Pajaro Valley, our entire county is seeing a much bigger decline than the state is seeing throughout the next 10 years. So just to be a little cautionary, again, we always see the, the May revise come out. A lot of times we see it come out and we actually have some good feelings about what the future holds, what it's going to look like. Um, the state's facing that $31.5 billion budget shortfall, as I mentioned. It's about $10 billion up from January. Part of the problem is the legislative analyst office, who always reviews the budget, actually works with UCLA to do projections on what they think the economy is going to do believes that that's still 60, there's a 66% chance or about a two-thirds chance that the governor's still projecting too high. So he's saying we're going to get about, we're going to be short about 31.5 billion. LAO's saying no, you're going to be short about 37, 38 billion dollars. So he's actually, they're actually anticipating that we'll see even more of a shortfall as he, as we get into October. Again, not knowing what those returns are going to look like and as people don't file until October. And that's all I have, so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one. Chris Webb. Uh, I want to thank the district for making the effort to survey stakeholders on LCAP input. And I'd like to take this opportunity to speak to a couple specific budgetary needs for, for Renaissance and hopes of informing how we make future budget allocations. So in service of LCAP goals 1, 6, 7, and 8, I'd like to reiterate the call for the uh, restoration of the model school recognized student progress monitoring system. Fiscally, this would mean um, an EWR for our English and math teachers who would stay after school and regularly support the after school program. And historically, the district has enjoyed the added benefit of other teachers supporting that program about once a month as an adjunct duty. Um, and it, in commitment to goals one and two, I'd suggest that we drop our CTE biology program, which we never did get a full-time teacher in for this year, and instead have a CTE auto tech class where we would have on, uh, utilize our on-campus auto shop, and that would give people a reason to be excited to come to school and hopefully boost our attendance and, and therefore the revenue that we're, we're earning. Um, also, I would like to suggest 
in commitment to LCAP goal one, we add, we add a, a full one FTE to Renaissance as part of hiring a full-time Spanish teacher so students can fulfill their graduation requirements without solely relying on edgenuity. And in commitment to LCAP goals one, four, and six, I think we should invest in a turf sports field at Renaissance so as to avoid this regular rodent disruption problem and provide a way for the site or the district to generate revenue from the rental of that space for different you know, sporting groups that may come around. Um, and then also in commitment to LCAP goal four, I'd like to just say that you know, as an econ teacher, the economists get added to district approved materials. And um, in commitment to LCAP goal five, we should restore our L ELS position to full time. Thank you. Thank you. Any discussion from the board? Trustee DeSerpa? Can you go back a slide? Absolutely. Where's, maybe back one more. Yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit that's, um, about the reduction to arts, music, and instructional materials discretionary block grant? We talked a lot about that at the delegate assembly, but in terms of the 49%, that's not what we would be looking at. It's just what the state would be looking at in terms of cutting the block grant and then reallocating the remainder of the money. Do we get, would it be a 50% cut to what we're currently getting? That's so far as what we're seeing in the way we've been reading it, yes, we would effectively every district would see about a 49% reduction because they would allocate it in the same way in terms of allocating it by ADA um, and by UPP count. So they would allocate it a similar way, but they'd have 50% less to allocate. So for us, again, about 4.5 to 4.7 million. It's tough because they haven't put out the exact number with the reduction. So we don't know what that number will look like with the reduction for each district. Okay, that's a shame. It really is. Just to, to clarify, because I know there's, we often talk about, you know, what was Prop 28, is that the same thing as the discretionary block grant? It is not. So Prop yeah. 28 is um, separate completely yeah. from Proposition 98. I just want to thank you for a great presentation. I want to thank you and uh, our administration for doing a great job and the board for, I think, the district being in pretty decent financial health. We have a lot of needs um, in our school district, and we're going to be deliberating the budget in June. Very important discussion. So for all those watching, we want to hear from you. Please give input to us as, as the board. We want to hear about your needs, and I just want to thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Going back to what you were saying about with that, um, the income and the, the taxes with mm -hmm. that shortfall, but was it 42 billion? So the shortfall is 31.5 billion but and the then- shortfall, but for the, the taxes that they were deferring to- Oh, fall. right. Sorry, 40, uh, yeah, 42 billion. So the downside of that is that revenue for the state is what directly impacts our cash. So if, it's, if they're not going to see about $42 billion until October, we don't know if we'll see cash deferrals in October. Cash deferrals are always tough because what happens is the state ends up saying, we're only doing deferrals, right? We're not taking the money back. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening is by the time they have to pay us the money, they say, we're going to use some of the new revenue to pay those cash deferrals. So even though they say, you didn't lose anything in this deal because we paid you what we said we would, right? But you used next year's revenue to pay the deferrals from this year. So really it does impact us. We, that's where we typically see a loss of one-time money or um, even a potentially unfunded COLA in the future that we faced, I believe, about three years ago. Does it ever happen, like I, I don't know that we've encountered, at least in the five years that I've been on the board, we haven't had this particular you know, kind of situation, but it's like, does it ever happen where if there is that, like if let's say that $42 billion does show up in October, but then they'll have, you know, the, the taxes due again in, in April. Do you ever see a benefit from that compression of revenue or does that just, it, does it not? It, it depends. So it, it kind of goes both ways because you see the increase because as many of you know, when people get tax returns, 
a lot of the times they go and they spend that money. So the state actually does see an influx in revenue. Um, however, I think with this current budget, the governor and the Department of Finance have actually anticipated a lot of that and anticipated a lot of the increases. Hence why I think in January they had such a high estimate because of course in January they didn't know they would defer. So they thought by April they would see those tax returns come in, people would spend that money. Um, I don't know if, again, to your point, I've never seen it, so I don't know if we'll see some sort of compounding based on someone getting a tax return in April, in October and then turning around in April again. But um, I think the bigger concern is just not knowing what those numbers are until October and therefore really the state not knowing what those revenues will be until probably November, even early December. Thank you. Of course. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 9.1, approve agreement 2023-24, uh, the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy. The report will be presented by Lisa Geria, our Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. Good evening, President Home Board Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. I have the pleasure this evening um, to bring forward for you the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy MOU that we have this year for the 23-24 upcoming school year. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with the program, in 2010, President and CEO of Granite Rock, Bruce Wolpert, who was an advocate of math and um, believed in the abilities of students and wanted to increase underrepresented students in the STEM field, uh, partnered with uh, his vice president, um, Kevin Jeffries, and then worked with um, a CSUMB professor who, who, who um, then created the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy starting with Rolling Hills Middle School. Today, the uh, academy serves uh, 12 schools, six of those schools being from PVUSD, with over 72 students. So the um, academy itself, um, it's a year-long uh, algebra-focused program that includes careers that ha in the um, algebra, in the math fields. It is um, around to have students fall in love with math, have hands-on experiences, and also um, to um, have students explore different career opportunities in the math field. So the, the year begins with Immersion Week, which takes place at the end of summer. Um, students, this year we have 30 uh, PBUSC students, which is an increase from, um, next year will be an increase from this year. That starts off in an Immersion Week where students have a week long, it's a full day, almost like an entire school day, where they have um, projects, they have, have a lunch time, and they have work that, that they have to do in the afternoon. Um, and then at the end of the week, it concludes with a field trip to CSUMB. Our students go to um, Driscoll's for the immersion week. It is a four to one staff to student ratio. Um, throughout the year, students have the opportunity to have enrichment sessions. In the past, it was field trips where students would go to Granite Rock to have um, different experiences. Uh, due to the, um, we were not able to provide enough, um, have enough substitutes that all, not all students could attend. We're changing it a little bit this year through um, conversations with Christy Sessions and her with her board. Uh, what's gonna happen is instead, we're gonna look at it more like on a Saturday where students are able to go and do a lot more hands-on activities with robotics, et cetera, and this will happen throughout the year. Some of the benefits and impacts is um, having more students exposed to um, math, STEM, career fields and also to increase the number of, of students from the unrepresented population into the STEM related careers. Thank you and I'd like to give special attention and special thank you to the board for uh, the the current board of the W the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy which is I'm Kevin Jeffrey the current vice president Roseanne Wolpert um, Bruce's wife um, Christy Sessions, who we work closely with, that is our partner, and Emmett Linder from uh, Driscoll's. And so with that, I ask for approval of the MOU with, um, for the Algebra Academy for this year. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? Yes, we do. We have one, Nellie. Good evening, board. Um, I, I, this, I'm so glad to see that this is still happening. Um, I'm. I guess I must have missed it in previous board meetings. I feel like they all kind of become one. 
But um, I actually used to work, I worked a summer um, with this program and my husband did as well. Uh, my husband is an economist, that's what he, he is uh, a graduate of Penn at the University of Pennsylvania and in, in economics and used to work, be one of those people that called out uh, you know, on the stock market floor, um, you know, trading millions of dollars. And that was just the ability of, of being able to calculate um, and analyze and do, um, you know, financial analysis. So it is a really great opportunity for our students. My son also attended um, a summer of, of um, Algebra Academy. Uh, the students are really kind of just in a like-minded space. Uh, so I just wanted to come up and speak to it and uh, about, be, you know, it's something that's super positive and uh, I think I'm glad it's real around and thankful for the program um, and for the community for giving back this way. Thanks. All right. Any, any discussion from the board? Trustee DeSerpa. Thank you, and thank you for um, making this a presentation um, under our action items. Um, Bruce Wolpert uh, was a graduate of PVUSD, um, went on to Stanford, and was very beloved in the community. He also cared very deeply for the kids of this district and um, had his own board to vet board members to make sure that they had the best interest of students in mind in terms of their achievement in academics because he wanted to see these kids have a better opportunity in life. This was his idea. He started this um, because he was in contact with um, some professors over at CSUMB who told him that the kids coming out of our district were not prepared for math and that it, they were having to do remedial work just to um, do the basics. So this was sort of the brainchild of professors from CSUMB and Bruce Wolpert, who devoted a lot of money, time, attention, um, and his heart, really, into making this happen. So I want to thank Roseanne for continuing um, to do this in honor of her late husband and for all the kids in our district. Um, I want to thank Kevin Jeffrey, who also <coughs> served on our Education Foundation. Thank you, Kevin, for doing that. Um, but we really appreciate that these kids get special attention in a in an atmosphere that they make it really fun, I think, to learn. That was, that was one of the most important pieces is that math is fun. And I know that, that the curriculum that they use um, makes it really great for kids. So thanks again for bringing this forward. And, and I'd like to make a motion to approve. Anyone else? We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Motion carries 601. Thank you. All right. Going on to item 9.2 PVUSD and City of Watsonville Summer in the City MOU. The report will be <laughs> presented by Julie Edwards, our CTE coordinator. Good evening, Board President Holm, trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I have the pleasure of being here tonight to share with you about Summer in the City along with my colleague Jen Littleton Bruno, Director of Expanded Learning. Um, so Summer in the City is an internship program um, with the City of Watsonville and PVUSD. It is a five-week internship program for rising juniors and seniors, some of who you met tonight earning the seal of civic engagement. All of those students participated in Summer in the City last summer um, from Aptos, PV High, and Watsonville High Schools. S the students learn about local government, they learn how a school district works, and they get the opportunity to learn about career readiness and themselves. The City of Watsonville and PVUSD contribute to different aspects of putting Summer in the City together. In this year, which is the fourth year, the growing collaboration with the City and PVUSD Expanded Learning will serve 48 of our students. Last year we had 22 students. So it, we more than doubled in a year. Um, next, the, the students will learn how local government operates, what being an active citizen means. They acquire career readiness, as I mentioned, get involved in improving the community. They learn about registering to vote in the future when they're old enough to do so and how to positively advocate for themselves and others. 
They learn about careers in city government and public service and gain valuable real world work experience. In the morning, all 48 students gather at the city. This year they'll be in the city library where they have food available, which is being provided by our food and nutrition services. Um, and they'll be involved in identifying a civic engagement project. They go on a lot of sort of mini field trips to different parts of the city of Watsonville. And um, they'll be hearing from a community partner around financial literacy, personal finance, which is something that was a request from last year from students, so we found that. They will be doing college and career exploration. All of our students will have the opportunity to um, participate in the Clifton Strengths Assessment and learn about their strengths and how to use them as they work together in teams. They'll be going, um, they'll be engaging in a Cabrillo College one unit course called CG51 Career Guidance. It's a, a, a college planning course, so that's embedded as well. They'll go for a whole day to Mount Hermon to do the ropes course, and at the end they go to Great America for a celebration. Every afternoon, students go to their internship sites. So in the morning, they're all together, they're learning in groups. In the afternoon, they split up into groups. So um, a couple of students will be at the fire department, a couple of students will be at public works in various parts of the city of Watsonville. Two groups of students come to PVUSD. Half will be working on a project, which I'll talk about in a minute, and they're, they're each working on larger projects here at the school district. Um, the, the uh, civic engagement project that they're involved with will help them to identify a real world problem or need, that they'll learn about root cause analysis and figuring out why things happen. They'll do some research on work already being done in that area and imagine what might be possible. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll be meeting with mentors at the city from the different project areas. So if their area of interest is public works or parks and rec, a representative from that department will come and talk to them about the problem that they've identified and collaborate with them and support them as they imagine how that problem could be addressed. And then at the end, they will present at a mock city council meeting in the council chambers at the city of Watsonville. Our interns, all of them, all 48, have the chance to make friends and have new learning experiences, um, self-development and growth. They will prepare to earn the seal of civic engagement, which I'm super excited about. They're going to learn about, Moriel is, this is one of the first steps toward in going from three to 50, hopefully next year, is that all of these students will have the chance to see themselves earning the seal of civic engagement. Um, They'll get that college credit, 10 elective high school credits, and they are paid $1,000 from the city of Watsonville. It's a stipend. Here's a picture from last year when they were at Mount Hermon, swinging through the trees. And then in the afternoon, this is a group of our students working with Dr. Rodriguez on this year's theme and the logo that we've enjoyed so much this year that students gave input to and, and and made really good suggestions for things to get tuned a little bit. And um, these students will learn how our school district operates. They will receive presentations from different departments within PVUSD so they can learn about finance and food and nutrition and transportation and um, student services and all the different departments that make up a large school district. And um, so basically the of the 48 total students, 28 come here to the district. Half will be working on a project with um, Michael Berman of the um, state, federal, and equity on, a parent, on the Parent Engagement Network pro Outreach Project. And the rest of the students will be developing the implementation of the seal of civic engagement that will roll out to all of our high schools this fall. So they'll be imagining what kind of advertising, what kind of resources will students on our different um, high school campuses need in order to um, participate in earning the state seal of civic engagement. So that is summer in the city and I um, brought the MOU with the city to this meeting. I'm excited to share with you um, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion or questions from the board? Trustee Soto. 
And thank you, Julie. It's a good uh, immersion program for the kids to understand, you know, civics and education. And that being said, are the programs isolated to those specific departments or are other departments involved in the city? There's a variety of departments. There's one that I, I can't rattle them all off of the top of my head right now, but definitely the library, fire, police, parks and rec, um, public works, and then vehicle maintenance, I think is one of them. I'm not sure if that's the right name, but it's where they work on the equipment that the city workers use in all the different right. areas of city so, maintenance. So is the planning and building department involved in this as well? Is I can find out. That? I'm It'd not sure. It would be great sure. to see if they're part of that so they can learn uh, civic planning you know, mm -hmm. as it applies to you know, everybody's personal property and what the laws that govern what can be placed in that specific part of our property based on the, you know, certain codes and laws on the building aspect of it. Yeah, I can find that out and, and feed that information back yeah, that would for be sure. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. That's awesome. Thank you for spearheading this, both of you. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Thank you. Moving on to item 9.3, approve certificated job description school counselor K-12 school sites. Report will be presented by Allison Yuzawa, our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources. Yes, thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So I have a job description for you tonight for a school counselor for K-12 um, school sites. But I want to just take a step back and explain how it came to be and why it's in front of you tonight. So. Um, PCCS went through a WASC accreditation. Um, they, are, they had their site visit, so you've heard a lot from our student representatives tonight even about their WASC visits. So the WASC visit is the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. And what that means is our secondary sites, high school and our community colleges, have a team that comes in and reviews their entire educational program from top to bottom to ensure that they are, and it's a self-study, so the site is the one looking at themselves to ensure that their programs they are offering are meeting the needs of their students, as well as to continue the good work that they are already doing. So when a visiting team comes, they also provide a report back to the school with recommendations based on their, on their findings and what they did during their self-study. Um, and so that is why this job description is in front of you tonight, because there was a recommendation from the committee, the visiting committee at PCCS, to have a stronger academic counseling um, presence as well as social emotional counseling. So this job description kind of marries the two together. Um, it follows the AXA model, which is what our school counselors fall under as their professional um, organization. And so this job description includes both um, academic support for students as well as social emotional um, counseling support. So um, PDFT and I worked very quickly. Uh, we had a discussion this week and we worked swiftly to put this together so that PCCS can make good on their recommendation from the committee to move forward with hiring for this position. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any questions or discussion from the board? I have a motion to approve. Thank you. I'll second, I'll but I'll, I do have a comment. Okay, go ahead. Um, so do you have to, you have a, like a PPS degree? Yeah, you do? It's, yeah. It's not um, like a license. Just no, so the PPS degree. credential allows you to do academic counseling as well as social emotional counseling, but very in more of the social behaviors, um, not like clinical um, group therapy support, but more making good choices. Okay, I won't resign then. I was gonna resign and apply. <laughs> Wait, hold, oh, hold on. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> Thank you. That's all. Just kidding. Okay, first and second. I have a first and a second. If there's no further comments, I'll do the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, moving on to item 9.4, approved notice of award for the Alianza Charter and Watsonville Charter School of the Arts Fire Alarm Replacement Project. Uh, we were presented by um, Erlindo Fernandez, our Director of Maintenance Operations and Facilities. 
Good evening, President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, Cabinet. My name is Elinda Fernandez. And I'm the Director of Maintenance and Operations. I'm here to ask for the approval of the Alianza Charter School and Watson Beach Charter School of the Arts Fire Alarm Replacement Project. This is an F ESSER funded project on April 14th and April 21st, the district advertised the Alianza Charter School and Watson Beach Charter School of the Arts Fire Alarm Project. A mandatory bid block was held on the 24th of April. Three contractors were present at that time. On May, f May 15, 2023, the district received one se sealed bid from Premier Builders Incorporated. The sealed bid came in at $1,283,322. And I'm here to ask for the approval so we could continue the contract with Premier Builders for the amount of $1,283,322 for Premier Builders. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee Soto? Hey, Herb, how you doing? Good. So is this getting rid of the old simplex system over there? Correct. And Thank we're, God. we're that, that thing was junk. Yep. It's costing us a, a lot of money like just to keep it going. $1,200 service call just for them to come out and look at it every time. So yeah. Yeah. So and this, it, this is good that we're finally upgrading that system. Thanks. Is yeah. that a motion? And that's a motion to approve, yes. And sure. I'll second that. Thank you. Great. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Thank opposed? You. Motion carries 601. Thank you. Moving on to item 9.5, approve EB Design Studio Architect Agreement for the Bradley Elementary School Roofing and IP System Project 2024-001. Report will be presented by Arlindo. Please continue. Good evening again. President Holm, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees. Um, for this project, I'm asking for the approval for EB Design and Architects um, for their services for a total bid biddable said for the project. This is an ESSER funded project and this project is estimated construction cost would be two million six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. With this for their services there I'm asking for the approval of three hundred twenty four thousand six hundred and twenty five dollars. Do we have any public speakers to that item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? Uh, Trustee DeSerpa? Which part of the, the whole thing's getting re-roofed? Correct. Great. And how about gutters? Uh, that's part of the roofing, yeah. Excellent. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Um, item 9.6, approve notice of award for Hall District Elementary School HVAC and Roof Coating Project, 2023-006. Uh, it's still you. Good evening again. This is another roofing project, and this is at Hall District Elementary School, and also we're also repla replacing the HVAC system. Um, this is an ESSER-funded project. This project was advertised on April 4th, 14th and April 21st, 2023. A mandatory bid work was held on the 25th of April. Three contractors were present on May 9th. The district received one sealed bid from the following contractor. Premier Builders came in with their bid at $1,697,510. I'm here to ask for the approval for Premier Builders to proceed with the contract for the roofing project at Hall District. Thank you. Any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion or questions from the board? I'll entertain a motion. No. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. All right, going on to item 9.7, approved notice of award for the Mar Vista Elementary School sewer lift station project 
2023-030. Please continue. Good evening again. For this project is Mar Vista Elementary School Lift Station. It's a well needed project out there. I'm glad we're going forward. Hopefully we, you guys approve it. Um, this is an This is a what is it? Uh, maintenance, main, maintenance, routine maintenance funded project. This project is was advertised on April 21st. The district advertised the sewer lift station project. The mandatory bid work was held on uh, April 26. Four contractors were present on that day. On May 16th, 2022, the district received one sealed bid from the following contractor: Premier Builder was the only contractor that submitted a bid for the amount of 173 with 206 dollars. I'm asking for the approval to continue with the contract with Premier Builders. Any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any questions or discussion from the board? Uh, just a clarification. Herlinda, you said Premier Builders, but it says 101 Builders. Is this, this one is what we're seeing. Marvis Elementary. Uh, we're on what, 9.7? Oh, you know what? Yeah, Premier Builders. You know, you know what it is? It is, uh, that's Miss Spring right there. It is one on one builders. It's, it is one on one. It is, it's, one, it one, is one, one, one builders, not Premier Builders. Okay, just wanted that's that point Spring. of clarification. Thank you for bringing that up. That's not misprinted. Um, that's printed correctly. You misspoke or vice versa, just for clarification. You know what? My, my document is misprinted. Sorry. So that's correct. That's correct, right there. Okay. Um, it says 101 builders on the backup. Right, but he had said stated premier. Premier yeah. builders. Yeah, my, a my document is right, misprinted. No, I'm just asking oh, for a point yeah. of clarification. Yeah. That's Great. Okay. Sorry. That, and with that, I'll approve that. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good catch. Can you, I have a question, Linda. Can you say exactly what this thing is? What is a school sewer lift station project? Over at Mar Vista, we currently have just one lift station for the sewer, for the sewer for the restrooms. This lift station has been giving us a lot of issues. When it goes down, we have to bring in porta potties. School's not very happy when we do that, and students don't like to use the porta potties. We're going back in with two lift stations, like it should be, so that if one of them fails, the other one takes over. Is it like a pump? Or like they're pumps. Yeah, yeah they're pumps. pumps. Okay, yeah. They're basically, it's a collection point for all the sewage yeah. system. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so basically, it's a collection point for the sewer system, and it's at a lower level than the main line, so it's not fed by gravity. So it has to collect in that well yeah. where the pump is, and once the pump pumps. reaches a certain level, there's a float switch that activates it that causes it to pump upward into the main okay. line, which is gravity fed to the uh, sewer sweet, uh, treatment plant. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very important. <laughs> I'm all in favor. All right, so we've got a first and a second for keeping our stuff together. Um, <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Uh, motion carries 601. Thank you. All right, going on to um, item 9.8, approved notice of award for the Rolling Hills Middle School Concrete <coughs> Repairs uh, Project 2023-004. Once again, good evening. Um, this is a um, project well needed at Rolling Hills School. It's uh, concrete repairs. This is an ESSER funded project. And on April 14th, 21st, the district advertised the Rolling Hills Middle School Concrete Project. Mandatory was held on the 24th. Six contractors were present on, on May 15, 2022. The district received three sealed bids from the following contractors. Uh, the lowest bid, the, the lowest bid would go to Basco Construction Service Incorporated, which had the lowest bid for the amount of $226,000 even. So I'm asking for the approval for this project to continue. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Um, any discussion from the board? Can I have a motion? I have a first. Do I have a second? Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries 601. Dr. Rodriguez, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to commend the board for their action in taking the 30 million of one-time funding for these projects. These are all, except for one, have been our ESSER projects. And so as you can see, they're very needed projects. And so the board had the foresight of using that one-time money for these facility needs. And then I just want to appreciate the staff. Um, it was Clint, Herlindo, and Colleen who did the individual um, reports to get approval to do these projects. So we actually, for each and every one of these projects, we had to get individual approval um, from CDE to be able to use ESSER money. So it was quite the feat to be able to get that done. So thank you on both counts, and I think our sites will be better places because of it. Thank you. Dr. Rodriguez, could you elaborate which is the just the one that isn't? Sure. Um, there, the actual Mar Vista is using the um, is using um, the restricted um, routine restricted maintenance, maintenance fund, and the rest of them, the larger ones, are all using the ESSER project. Thank funding. you for the elaboration. All right, going on to item nine point nine, are approving uh, the. Um, Migrant Seasonal Head Start Freedom New Relocatable Classroom Contingency Extension. Once again, this is um, Lindo, and I'm here to ask for the extension for the Freedom New Relocatable Classroom Contingency. Um, this contingency brought up the total percentage of 16.7 to add to the original contract amount. This is due to the severe weather we had the storms, we had to uh, build a foundation and we had to do a lot of extra work just to get, just to get it, you know, to pass inspections. So I'm asking for the approval for $48,791 for this 16.7 um, increase from the board. Do we have any public speakers to this item? We do not. Any discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. Second. Oh, I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Thank you. All right. Moving on to our consent agenda item, which is our routine items coming before the board. Do we have any public speakers to the consent agenda? We do not. Are there any items that the board wishes to defer? Can I have a motion? Uh, I have a first. Uh, second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 601. Um, let's see here. Moving on to item. 13, our action report on closed session. Are there any items to report from closed session? Uh, yes, there are. So, um, with regards to closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on May 24th, 2023 with 14 and eight additional action items. May I need a second? Second. Thank you. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 601. Okay. With regards to closed session item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on May 24th, 2023 with 12 and 10 additional action items. I need a second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 601. In uh, closed session with um, regards to item 2.5, um, the board approved a certificated employee unpaid leave and health wealth and welfare settlement agreement for employee 6852 with a 5002 vote. In closed session on item 2.5, the board approved a certificated employee unpaid leave and health and welfare settlement agreement for employee 2024 with a 5002 vote. And we have one announcement out of closed session. PVUSD is pleased to announce the selection of Liz Ettinger as the interim principal for Aptos Junior High School. 
Liz has been working with students in PBUSD since 2004 when she started as a language arts teacher at Aptos Junior High School. Liz has been an integral member of the staff at Aptos Junior during her tenure. In 2022, she became the assistant principal and continued to demonstrate her strong leadership skills and has fostered many more positive relationships with students and families. Liz holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from Humboldt State and a single subject credential in Social Science, English, and Computer Concepts and Application. Liz is currently finishing her Administrative Intern Credentialing Program and will hold a preliminary administrative credential in the fall. We are excited to welcome this highly qualified educator to her new position, Go Sea Dragons. And that is our last announcement and report out of closed session for this evening. Thank you. All right, so our, our next regular board meeting will be on June 14th, 2023. And with that, I'm adjourning the meeting at 946.